Hi class, I hope you're doing well. Uh, welcome to uh, the middle of the week. So today we're going to continue our discussion about exoplanets and in particular today we want to tar, uh, start talking about habitability. That is to say planets where we might imagine that life like the life we see here on Earth might actually be able to survive. So we're going to talk about the things that influence habitability today. Uh, we'll talk about examples of what we talk about today has uh, changed or influenced the habitability of worlds that we know here in the solar system on Friday uh, and, and uh, the influence of planetary properties in particular on that. Um, and then next week we will talk about the actual search for exoplanets. Okay, so in the image behind me tonight uh, is the summer Milky Way. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some stars uh, that you can actually see uh, on your own if you go out stargazing uh, during your time at home. Uh, so this is the Milky Way, uh, the summer Milky Way as we call it. Uh, the constellation Sagittarius is down below the frame here, uh, but then it kind of comes straight up and it arches over the middle of the sky during the summer. So right now at about 10 o'clock at night, this is just rising. So it's kind of on the eastern side of the sky. Uh, if you wait till kind of two or three in the morning, it'll start being overhead. By the middle of summertime, this will be overhead right when you go out at night. Okay, so in particular, I'm going to talk to you about a star called Vega uh, a little bit uh, into the lecture, uh, this segment of the lecture. And Vega is located in a place called the Summer Triangle, which is kind of up here high in the, in the Summer Milky Way. Okay, uh, and this was, uh, you've, you've seen uh, this earlier in the semester. Uh, this is an astrophoto of the Milky Way I took in the Pando Forest. So the Pando Forest, you may remember we talked about uh, uh, early on as one of the oldest organisms we know on Earth. So I love taking my telescope to the Pando Forest because it's seen about 30 million Milky Way rises like this. So. Okay, so let me go ahead and start some slides. So what we're gonna start with is we're gonna start talking about the energy of the stars. So it's actually a, a variety of things that influences what we call habitability. We'll define that kind of more precisely uh, in the second half of today's lecture. Uh, but, uh, but the energy from the stars is one of the big uh, uh, influences on whether or not a planet will be quote unquote habitable. Okay, so uh, to do this, uh, we'll start with where we left off last time. We'll, we'll talk about the HR diagram, use it to guide us in our thinking about the properties of stars. We'll talk about the sizes and temperatures of stars and how that influences their energy output. And then we'll talk about energy from afar. That is to say the energy a planet receives depending on how far it is from its parent star. Okay. So this is where we left off uh, last time. Uh, this is the uh, Hertzsprung-Russell or HR diagram. Uh, we use this for many, many different purposes in astronomy, uh, not the least of which is telling the story of how stars live their lives. Uh, you'll remember that across the bottom or in the horizontal direction, we plot spectral type, which is synonymous with temperature. Okay, so that means uh, in this graph, hot stars are on the left stars are on the right. In the vertical direction, we plot the brightness of the stars, some measure of the brightness that might be something called magnitude, it might be something called luminosity, but it's a measure of the brightness. Okay, and so in this plot, then the convention is for bright stars to be on top and for dim stars to be on the bottom. And if you plot those properties of the stars, you get this very interesting structure that we discussed last time. And what I want to do today is I want to focus just on this part of this, on the so-called main sequence. Um, stars, like people, they change constantly throughout their lives. So there are times in their lives where they're at different temperatures. There are times in their lives when they uh, have different amounts of energy they output. Uh, there's times in their lives when they're different sizes. And all of those things uh, ultimately influence uh, the lives of the planets. And so we'll talk about that a little bit next week. But today, I want to just focus on this part of their life, their middle life. Okay, so when stars are on the main sequence, what we mean by that is that they're spending their time burning hydrogen and turning it into helium. Okay, and the word burn there is code for nuclear fusion. Okay, so this is the main energy source of the stars is nuclear fusion. And what we say is they take hydrogen, they use nuclear fusion processes, and they turn it into helium. Okay, so when stars are doing that, they lie here along the main sequence. 
Okay, now remember, uh, across, as you go down and up and down the main sequence, the brightness of the stars changes as you go uh, from high on the chart to low on the chart. And as you go across the main sequence, their temperature changes, cool stars on the right to hot stars on the left. So let's talk about what influences those properties of the stars. So the temperature uh, of a star is uh, highly dependent on many factors. Uh, but in particular, the temperature, what we care about when we're thinking about exoplanets, the temperature tells you how much one little segment of the star actually glows. Okay, and what I mean by little segment is if I took a, a, a little picture frame and I set it down on the surface of the star and it didn't burn up, if I set it down on the surface of the star, the temperature tells me how much light is coming through that picture frame. And the assumption that we make is that no matter where I put it down on the star, it has the same temperature. And so the same amount of light comes from every little place on the star that I can put that picture frame. Okay? So temperature tells me how much that little segment of the star is actually glowing. And in particular, if a surface is hotter, it glows more. That's true of stars but it's also true of your everyday practical life. So those of you who have played around with your campfire, you know before you stick your stick or before you stick your poker in the campfire, it's cool, it's kind of dark, it doesn't glow very much. You stick it in the fire, it starts to warm up, it kind of glows a dull red. You get it even hotter, it glows even brighter, it turns yellow. If you get it really, really hot, it gets even brighter, it turns bright white, okay? So the, the amount that an object glows is directly related to the temperature that it has. And stars are no different than that poker that you're putting in the fire, okay? So here, I've shown you a very red star, and if you turn out all the lights in your, uh, in your uh, study or at your desk or your bedroom, wherever you're watching lecture right now, um, and try and read a book by the light of this red star, it's not gonna give out very much light. But if I turn it into a hotter star, hotter stars are bluer, Okay, so if I turn it into a blue-white star, there's a lot more light coming off of that surface. And so you can end up reading the book a little bit easier, okay? So hotter surfaces glow more, and in, in physics term, what we want to say is hotter stars give off more energy per unit little area that they have, okay? Okay, now, the other thing that influences the amount of energy that a star gives off is its brightness, okay? So just like we said on the last slide, if you take your little picture frame, no matter where you put it on the star, every little segment of the star glows with exactly the same amount, okay? So again, if you turn out all your lights, here's a little tiny star, okay? It's at some temperature that I've decided what it is. And so that amount of surface that you can see there glows just a little bit but it doesn't give off very much light. If you turn out all your lights and try and read your book by the light of that tiny star, you can't actually read it at all, okay? But if I were to make the star bigger, I'm not gonna change anything at all except give it more surface area. So there's more little segments of my picture frame that I could lay down, all giving off the same amount of light as that little star that I have right there. It gives off more energy. And if I make that star bigger, suddenly there's more energy being given off, okay? So bigger stars give off more energy than smaller stars. And that's kind of an incomplete statement. What I should really say to be complete is a bigger star gives off more energy than a smaller star that's at the same temperature, okay? Okay, uh, to, make the, to make the comparison completely clear, okay? Uh, certainly, there are bigger stars that can give off less energy than smaller stars if they're at different temperatures, but that kind of complicates issues. So here, I'm just trying to isolate size from temperature, and on the last screen, I used stars of the same size, and I was isolating temperature from size, okay? Okay, so let's use those two facts. Let's go back to the main sequence, okay? So the main sequence you see uh, crosses this diagonal band across the... Um, uh, across the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And in particular, you'll notice left to right is temperature, okay? And so our distinction that we made just based on temperature, which is that uh, stars that are hotter give off more energy, means stars on the left-hand side of this graph give off more energy than stars on the right-hand side of the graph. What isn't obvious from the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is that there's also a size variation on this diagram. And in particular, as you go from the bottom to the top of the graph, 
stars get bigger, okay? And there's physics behind that, but that is the general trend, okay? So I could imagine separating the HR diagram. If I'm up in the upper left, stars are big in size and they're very hot. So they give off tons and tons of energy. If I'm down in the lower right, stars are smaller, but they're also cooler. So they give off less energy than stars that are farther up the uh, main sequence from that. Okay? Okay. So let's look at the main sequence. Let's put some stars that we know, some stars we can see in the night sky on here, and let's look at their sizes and look at their temperatures. Okay? So uh, here's the sun. So the sun lies right in the middle of the main sequence. It's a type G star. Now the spectral types, if you look them up, they are actually subdivided into a finer grain. So there's actually 10 types inside each of the letters. They're given a number. They're G0, G1, G2, G3, all the way down to G9. So the sun's actually a type G2 star. Okay, but uh, here for convenience, we just plot OBAF, GKF. Okay, so the sun's on the main sequence, it's burning hydrogen right now, uh, and it's a type G2 star, so that's where it falls. Now, you may know of a star called Bellatrix. So Bellatrix is, uh, for all of you who are Potterheads, uh, was uh, Bellatrix Lestrange, right? So she's the uh, 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 evildoer in some of the Harry Potter films there. Uh, it's actually the right star in the shoulder of Orion. So we looked at Orion last class period, and the left star is a very red star called Betelgeuse, but the right star is Bellatrix, okay? But Orion, as we said last class, uh, is kind of near the sun right now, so it's very hard to see. So a star that you can see right now is called Spica. So Spica is the brightest star in the constellation Virgo. And when you go out at night, right when it's dark right now, about 10 o'clock here in Chicago, if you look kind of due south, uh, Spica and Virgo is, is right there in that part of the sky, okay? Now, the brightest star in the sky uh, is Sirius. And so those of you who are Potterheads will recognize that name from Harry Potter as well. Uh, in fact, all of the Lestrange kids were named after stars. So if you go look at all their names, they're all named after stars. Uh, but Sirius is in that part of the sky near uh, Orion. It's actually Orion's belt stars kind of point down to uh, towards Sirius. Uh, so it's hard to see right now because the sun's over in that part of the sky. So a star that you can see right now is Vega. And Vega is very close on the main sequence. Uh, to where Sirius is. And so Vega right now, uh, as we said at the beginning of class, is going to be up in that part of the sky called the Summer Triangle. When it first gets dark at night at about 10 o'clock, if you go out right now and you face to the east, it'll be the brightest star you can see in the east. So it's just starting to come up when it gets dark um, at this time of year. Okay? So what if I go past the sun in the other direction? on the main sequence, down to small dim stars. So stars that live down here in the lower right corner of the main sequence are usually called M dwarfs or red dwarfs, okay? And so a uh, famous uh, red dwarf is called Wolf 359. Uh, Wolf 359 uh, is famously where the uh, Enterprise fought the Borg and Picard was kidnapped and transformed into the locutus of Borg, okay? But Wolf 359, you can't see with your naked eye. Uh, it's about, uh, it takes a pretty big telescope to see it. It's in the constellation Leo. It's underneath the constellation Leo. Uh, so unless you have kind of a 10, 12 inch telescope, it's probably really hard to see. But a star you can see is Proxima Centauri. So Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf. Uh, you can see it with your naked eye because it is the closest star to the sun. Okay, and you often hear people say it's the closest star to Earth, but we all know the sun's a star and the sun's the closest star to Earth. So Proxima is actually the closest star uh, to the Earth, uh, uh, closest star to the sun. Okay, uh, it is in the southern sky, so you can't actually see it from Chicago. If you're in the southern part of the United States, if you're in Texas or Arizona or Florida, uh, then Centaurus will come up high enough that you can actually see it in the night sky. Okay. Okay, so let's take uh, Proxima, let's take the Sun, let's take Vega, and let's take Spica, and let's look at them all together, okay? So I'm going to represent the Sun. I'm going to put all these stars up here to scale. So I'll represent the Sun by this uh, green circle here. So the surface temperature of the Sun is about 5,700 Kelvin, okay? So it's very hot. You couldn't live there. It's really hot, but there are stars that can be much, much hotter. So in particular, Vega is just a little bit 
bigger than the sun, okay? But it's a lot hotter. It's 9,600 kelvins. It's almost twice as hot as the sun is, okay? And so intrinsically, Vega is a brighter star than the sun. It gives off more energy because it's hotter. It gives off more energy because it's bigger. Spica is even worse. Spica is an enormous star. Spica is this much larger than the sun. I don't remember how many times bigger. Sorry, I should have remembered that, uh, but I looked it up when I made the circle. You can look it up, but it's enormous compared to the sun. It looks like it's about five times the diameter of the sun there, okay? But its temperature is enormous. It's 25,000 degrees Kelvin, okay? So it's five times hotter, a little bit less than five times hotter than the sun. So Spica gives off enormous amounts of energy compared to the sun which is why it's a bright star in our night sky, even though it's pretty far away in the Milky Way galaxy, okay? By contrast, Proxima is a really tiny star. It's much, much smaller than the sun, and it's much cooler. It's only 3,000 Kelvin, okay? So it's just barely more than half the temperature of the sun. And so it doesn't give off nearly as much light as the sun. And in fact, when you look at it in the night sky, it's not terribly bright. It's certainly the brightest star in that region of the sky because it's really close to us, but it's not as bright as other stars you can see in the night sky. And that's because intrinsically it's small and intrinsically it's not very hot. So it doesn't glow as much as stars that are much hotter, okay? So all of this factors together into the total amount of energy that a star puts out and that influences what a planet actually receives for energy. And as we've discussed in the past, the energy you get from your parent star is the base energy for every form of life that we know on Earth because it kind of starts with the plants or starts with the uh, uh, organisms that utilize the energy from the star, from the sun in the case of Earth, and then all the rest of the ecosystem is built on consuming energy from those plants, okay? So I'll remind you that this is something that we've discussed before. So this is related to the one over R squared uh, law of light or the inverse square law of light as we called it. So imagine the energy that the earth receives. Okay, so in the past, we said if the earth is there at the distance R, if you get twice as far away, the same area receives less energy. Okay, but if the parent star is giving off more energy to start with, in order for you to receive similar energy from that star as we receive here on Earth, you have to get much farther away for the energy to spread out and disperse and become thinner so that when it falls on your surface, you're not just getting blasted. Okay, so you're used to this if you've ever hung out around a campfire. When you're very near the campfire, it's hot. And if you get farther away from the campfire, it's cooler. And that's because the energy from the campfire is spreading out and it's spread over a wider area so it doesn't feel as hot on you. Planets are exactly the same way. By a similar token, if the parent star gives off less energy, you have to get closer to the parent star to concentrate all of that energy in a smaller area so that you get the same effect, so you feel the same energy that the Earth receives from our own parent sun. Okay, and so that will greatly uh, influence what the properties on the surface of the exoplanet are, which ultimately, as we've discussed, leads to the conditions under which life uh, experiences itself. Okay, so together we have to think about both the brightness, uh, the energy output of the parent star, that's related to its temperature, that's related to its size, and we also have to think about the inverse square law of light, okay? So in the second half of lecture today, we'll take those ideas, we'll put them together, and we'll talk about how it influences the overall conditions that a planet experiences and leads to uh, this idea that we call habitability, okay? So uh, that's all I'm gonna say in this segment. I hope you're all doing well. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you in the next half.